We um, have started the last time. We have uh, gone over the first part of Act 16. So I think we stopped at verse 18 in the middle of that story about this girl that was demon possessed and then was set free from that power. So I'll read from Act 16 verse 19 to the end of the chapter. And her master, seeing that the hope of their gains was gone, having seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the market before the magistrates, and having brought them up to the praetors, that were the rulers of the city, ten men, said, These men utterly trouble our city, being Jews, and announce customs which is it not lawful for us to receive nor practice, being Romans. And the crowd rose up, too, against them. And the praetors, having torn off their clothes, commanded to scourge them, and having laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, cast them into the inner prison and secured their feet to the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, in praying, were praising God with singing, and the prisoners listened to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison shook, and all the doors were immediately opened, and the bonds of all loosed. And the jailer, being awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the doors of the prison opened, having drawn a sword, was going to kill himself, thinking the prisoners had fled. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And having asked for lights, he rushed in and trembling fell down before Paul and Silas. And leading them out, said, Sirs, what must I do that I may be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. And he spoke to him the word of the Lord with all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed them from their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And having brought them into his house, he laid the table for them and rejoiced with all his house, having believed in God. And when it was day, the praetors sent the lictors, lictors the policemen, saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul. The praetors have sent that he may be let go. Now therefore, go out and depart in peace. But Paul said to them, Having beaten us publicly, uncondemned, us who are Romans, they have cast us into prison, and now they thrust us out secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. And the lictors reported these words to the praetors, and they were afraid when they heard they were Romans. And they came and besought them, and having brought them out, asked them to go out of the city. And having gone out of the prison, they came to Lydia. And having seen the, ch the brethren, they exhorted them and went away. So far the reading of the scriptures. So we have seen how this enterprise, if I may use that word, the large enterprise that the Lord Jesus started was growing. And in our prayer we have uh, thought of that also, that this work that started in one place of this earth in Jerusalem uh, expanded first to Samaria, Galilee, then to the nations around and then to the ends of the Roman Empire. And this work that the Lord started in Acts 2 is still going on today. And that will uh, be finished at the rapture. Then that work come to a conclusion. And then God will start a new work with, in connection with Israel and with the nations of this earth. But now God is drawing people out from among Judaism, out from among the pagans and from the Gentiles, and to join them together to one head, the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. That is the new thing that God started in Acts 2 and that goes on. And after that, I said, after the rapture, God will turn the pages as it were and then start another work here on earth 
uh, with a different purpose and the purpose will be ultimately that everything will be laid under the headship of Christ then Christ will be honored in the millennium as the great leader but we may honor him already today as our great leader he is the head of the body and he is our great leader and we may honor him and we may follow his directions and that's exactly what Paul and Silas did and we've seen the last time how this little company of Paul and Silas was then uh, first of all uh, Timothy added to them and then later on uh, Luke the author of this book was added to them and there are many uh, verses in the book of Acts and I draw your attention to that and you really need to read carefully because the name Luke is not mentioned but when we is mentioned in verse 10 for example then Luke is included or us and there are many verses where we see that case and it's interesting when we have read tonight at the end of chapter 16 um, having gone out of the prison they came to Lydia and having seen the brethren they exhorted them and went away what does that mean? it means that Luke stayed so the, the we section is Luke included and the they Luke is not included and then later on when Paul came back after his third journey he went to Philippi again and then we see all of a sudden we again we'll see that in Acts 20 so then Luke is included again and he accompanied Paul so that is an important detail so then we have seen how the Lord led them to Europe now it doesn't mean that there were no believers yet in Europe I believe there were already believers in Europe but more in Rome in the area where other um, where, where Jewish people were living and they had become believers we have seen them in Acts 2 already that some came from all parts of the Roman Empire so also some parts were in Europe and they have gone back there and so in Rome a church was started I believe even before Acts 16 but what the remarkable point is in Acts 16 there we see that Paul the missionary to the Gentiles the great um, uh, apostle of the Gentiles there is where he had the first convert and we, saw, we talked about that the last time about Lydia the seller of purple in verse 14 and we've seen how there was a work of God in her we've seen how she opened her heart and the Lord opened her heart but she paid attention to Paul's word and th these are still important points for people today on the one hand God needs to open the heart on the other hand people need to pay attention and listen so that they can be saved and I want to come back to that in a few moments about the importance of hearing and believing we will see that in connection with the jailer and so then we have seen how there was this a subtle form of opposition uh, Paul and uh, Silas and uh, Timothy and Luke they went to the place of prayer uh, regularly and then there was this demon possessed slave girl who followed them and then made propaganda for them and then we have seen how Paul um, cast out the demon that led her and at that point <coughs> we have stopped and we see that God answered that prayer right away when Paul said I enjoin you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her in verse 18 at the end it came out the same hour so this demon came out and that was a remarkable uh, fact uh, that showed the power of the Lord Jesus it was in the name of the Lord Jesus it, not, it was not because of Paul's strengths or Paul's abilities it was because of Christ in the glory he was at work and he cast out that demon just like on this earth when the Lord Jesus was casting out demons it was in his power and so what we see in the book of Acts when these things happen it is the same Christ who is doing it but now from the glory and he does it through his people through Paul here and sometimes I believe that still happens uh, today especially in faraway countries where the gospel has not been preached but that still happens today that people are delivered by the power from the power of the demons through the power of Christ not because of human efforts so that will be a study in itself but then we move on to verse um, 19 and there we come to a point and I've touched upon that uh, several occasions already that financial matters often cause problems in the book of Acts 
here is these two masters and it may have been a couple that had this slave girl uh, in their possession and they benefited greatly from her uh, fortune telling this was a fortune teller and uh, they made lots of money from her and now this money the money was not gone but the expectation that they would earn more money from her that expectation was gone that's the point in verse 19 they saw that the hope of their gains was gone and I'm just mentioning that the, the matter of money plays a big role in the book of Acts and often it is connected with trouble and that's still the case today if people really uh, focus only on money then that means trouble now in this connection for Paul and Silas it meant trouble because they were uh, seized by the, the, this couple or by the two masters and dragged to the marketplace now why were they dragged to the marketplace in those days the uh, local government like the municipality would have a seat there on the market, there's a public place, the market is a public place and so there would be a, co a corner of, or a place where the rulers of the city uh, had a place and where things were decided like you had in Jewish towns, you had the gate, the idea of the gate the people in the gate would decide about the matters of the municipality and so here in the marketplace the people decided and those leaders were also um, those rulers or magistrates were also judges at the same time and um, that is where these people were brought then um, or these people brought Saul and Silas there we don't read about Luke and Timothy uh, they were perhaps less involved in the preaching so uh, this was limited to Paul and Silas and uh, they were brought there to the uh, judges they are called praetors in this uh, translation it is really the uh, governing body of the city and at that time there used to be ten men who were in charge of the um, ruling the city we have seen it was a Roman colony uh, we don't know how big uh, the community was um, at least a couple of ten thousands probably and we have seen it was uh, um, built after the example of Rome so it was a miniature Rome this colony of Rome there in, um, in Macedonia in Philippi uh, Philippi uh, maybe I mentioned that before uh, was really uh, the, um, named after the father of Alexander the Great who uh, occupied that place who named it after his uh, name and so that is where the name Philippi uh, comes from and um, in that city was a large um, community of um, uh, soldiers or retired soldiers and that is why the jailer as we will see later in this chapter he was a former um, uh, military man uh, maybe a captain uh, and he had now he retired and he had gotten this job as a jailer now to come back to verse 20 uh, when they are there now uh, in front of the judges and I just want to mention that Luke is very exact in the wording we have seen that all through the book so far when he uses a title or a description he uses the exact right term that was used for those people in that specific area and we see then that the complaint was and I want you to see that there were three false accusations these men utterly trouble our city well, that was not true they were quietly going their way they went to prayer they were not troubling the city but because they had cast out this demon they are now accused of utterly troubling the city but behind this accusation of course we have to remind ourselves of the fact that people, those people accused them because they lost their uh, gain or the hope of their future gains was gone and that is the reason why they accused them if they would have just continue to go about their business and go to the prayer meeting they would have not been accused the second accusation was they announced excuse me they, the second accusation was they were Jews now why is that so important see the first accusation is very understandable from a 
perspective of a Roman colony. A Roman colony, um, everything must be in order because if there's, a tr- if there's trouble, it is reported back to Rome and that doesn't give a good report in Rome. So the leaders of a, a colony, and in general in, in every part of the Roman country, they were very, very much concerned about trouble. They didn't want trouble because uh, that could mean all kinds of things. They could lose privileges or they could get uh, other forms of trouble. Uh, soldiers might be sent there. So they were always after peace and order. We'll see that later also in Acts 19, the uprising in Ephesus. The uh, leader there, the city treasurer the, or uh, secretary, he really tried everything to quiet down the multitude. And so they were, the leaders were always concerned about peace and uh, quietness in the city. So this was an accusation that really comes from that perspective. But the second accusation that these men were Jews... That is really an anti-Semitic, uh, that has anti-Semitic overtones. And uh, that has been all through the ages this, the case that Jewish people f- easily were accused uh, in a wrong way. They had not done anything wrong, but they were accused just by the fact they were Jews. Um, and then the third accusation, so that was not a false accusation. I, I mentioned there are false accusations. It was not a false accusation, literally. But the motive was wrong. In that sense, it was false. And the third accusation was they announced customs which it is not lawful for us to receive nor practice being Romans. Now, first of all, they did not know that Paul <coughs> and Silas themselves were Romans. They had Roman citizenship. They were Jews, but they were also Romans. And they were not preaching new customs that were against the Roman law. That was just a fabrication. They um, were preaching the gospel. And, <clears throat> of course, um, if you want to see it as, uh, as um, something that was not right, you can always see it as something that was not right. But what they were doing was not per definition wrong. They were not preaching against the Roman authorities. They were not introducing a new religion. Of course, here they tried to accuse them of that, that they introduced a new religion. And um, you can make notes and we can talk about uh, your questions at the end. But this was not preaching a new religion. Paul uh, was very careful to build upon the foundation that God has laid in the Old Testament and he built on that and God had continued to work it was not a new religion because that was forbidden if they would proselytize Roman citizens that was forbidden in the Roman law so this is um, uh, a difficult point some would see this as a right accusation some would see it as a wrong accusation to me it was a false accusation because it was based on false premises But then when we go on in verse 22, we see a fourth point, and that is really mob justice. Um, Here we see that the leaders, the magistrates, were not in control at all. The crowd rose up. So those two uh, masters who had uh, spoken here, the multitude that was present there at the marketplace, they uh, had heard about this, and now they stood up to support the claims of these two masters so here we see um, an example of mob judgment even the the magistrates were not in control here and they lost their control because we read that they torn off their clothes so they um, wanted they were as it were pushed by the multitude the multitude would would want um, uh, this situation set right right away and so the leaders the uh, judges were pushed to go into that direction without doing any investigation, without any fair trial. They just went about taking the clothes of uh, Paul and uh, and Silas away. That was a tremendous insult, by the way. And Paul refers to that later in 1 Thessalonians, when he writes 1 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 2, he refers to this uh, insult, this unfair... um, treatment that uh, they experienced here in Philippi.
And <clears throat> this is also something that happens to believers uh, today, that there is no matter of right or wrong, but that it's just a matter of prejudice, or that it is a matter of mass uh, judgment, the multitude decides. So, and when the multitude gets carried away, it's very dangerous. A multitude cannot be controlled. You'll see that in more detail in Acts 19, where you have that uh, uh, mass uprising in Ephesus. It is really a very scary thing. Yet, God is always in control. We should not forget that. God is always in control. Even in a situation like this, where you say, well, it's totally out of control. There is one who is always in control. And he allows certain things to happen up to a certain point. And then we'll see later in this chapter how God shows that he is in control. We'll see that in connection with the earthquake. So in verse uh, 22 at the end, the magistrates command then that uh, Paul and Silas get scourged. That was a very harsh treatment. So that was not justified at all. Um, because they had not been examined yet. The, the matter was not uh, researched. Nothing of that kind. But here the leaders decide to have them scourged just to, to give in to the sentiment of the mob. <coughs> uh, when you make a note of that, you could study in Second Corinthians 11, Paul gives a whole list of um, um, treatments that he had, this kind of physical abuse. It's an amazing list. You think how Paul has suffered during the time that he was working as an apostle. It is really incredible. And we have seen in Acts 9, when the Lord called him, that the Lord showed to, to Paul, then at that was time it was still Saul, or well, he had double name, Saul the Hebrew name, Paul the Latin name, but the Lord showed him in a vision how much he would suffer for the name of Christ. And so that brings me to another point that I wanted to mention, the matter of suffering. I said earlier, the Lord is in control, although it seems that things are completely out of control. But the Lord had allowed this form of suffering, because through this um, the, the jailer would be saved ultimately, but this was also part of God's program for, for uh, Paul and Silas themselves. Um, we should not forget that, that God allows sufferings, different forms of sufferings in our lives, through different circumstances. Many believers are being persecuted and they have all kinds of sufferings. This is part of God's program to train the believers. Romans 5 speaks about that. Romans 8:28. God makes all things work together for the good of those who love God. And if you study First uh, Peter, Peter also was exposed to all kinds of um, uh, sufferings and he speaks to the believers, you make a note of that very interesting, he shows why we have to suffer we are in God's school that's my point here Paul and Silas are in God's school God for some reason has allowed them to suffer and they have learned something we'll see that they have learned something because in midnight they start to sing so this is God's school to train them in 1st Peter 2 you see that you can suffer because of conscience that your conscience uh, cannot accept certain things that the world wants to, you to follow or you can suffer because of righteousness sake 1st Peter 3 you can suffer because of the name of Christ. The Lord spoke about that already in the Sermon on the Mount. There are different forms of sufferings that the Lord may allow us to go through. And there is also this aspect that the enemy attacks the believers. The enemy is like a roaring lion, as you find here with this mob, to attack the believers. That is something that God allows at the same time, First Peter 5. But we see here that God is really fully in control and we see that then in a few moments in verse 25 but I just want to uh, highlight a few points in verse 24 where you see Sorry. <coughs> in verse 24 you see how they were uh, secured with their feet in the stocks now remember their backs had been beaten up 
they were bleeding and suffering because of that um, so we were talking about the sufferings that God had allowed parts of his program but now on top of that this jailer put their feet in the stocks and if you read the whole passage you see that they were in the inner prison that is like a dungeon and so they would not be able to escape from there anyway from that dungeon it's impossible you, you jumped in that you, you are thrown into that dungeon you cannot get away of that but on top of that they were put with their feet in the stocks my suggestion is the jailer who had been charged to keep them safely had heard this story about this um, exorcism and maybe there was some superstitious fear also in him like if those people can <coughs> cast out demons maybe somehow they can get out of this prison and then I am I am guilty that was the Roman law if the the jailer would let those people go he would pay with his own life and that's later in the story that we see that he wants to kill himself because he knew that so he wanted to make sure that they would not be able to get away and he was perhaps a bit afraid that they were um, using tricks because they were able to uh, cast out these demons so that may be a, a superstitious fear that he had now I want you to see now we come to this miraculous intervention and I have ten miracles listed here. It is amazing. God is the God of miracles. And I want you to read verse 25 starting with the word but. You can translate it like and but it, according to the Greek you can also translate it but. Because this but is really in contrast to what happened. So far, what we have read so far, it seems things are totally out of control and now we see how God gets into the picture but at midnight there is the but of God and it's interesting those buts connected with God you see a situation is hopeless and then all of a sudden but God and here God is at work at midnight just a little side note there's many references to what happened in the night in the book of Acts and uh, we are living in the night of this world uh, in the millennium it will be the day then the sun will shine, the sun of righteousness but now we are living morally speaking in the night and there are a lot of references in the book of Acts to the night, what happened at night here even at midnight people, occult people believe that at midnight Satan has special uh, activity but anyway, that is superstition of course but at that point, when the people think that Satan has his, uh, his way, we see that God had his way. Why did God ha have his way? Because Paul and Silas were praying. And I want you to um, <coughs> note um, a few points in connection with prayer. It, was, it struck me that this verb that is used for prayer in the book of Acts is used 28 times, 4 times, 7 times. We have seen uh, the book of Luke we see the Lord as the man of prayer and we have noticed several times in the book of Acts that the believers are marked by prayer and that is also for us important today to be marked by prayer what can we do without prayer prayer really is an expression of helplessness and hopelessness we cannot do it the Lord said in John 15 without me you cannot do anything and so prayer what does prayer do Prayer is an expression of dependence on God, but prayer introduces the Lord. Prayer introduces the power of God. Not necessarily spectacular and sensational things. Sometimes that can happen too. But the point is, through prayer, God gets introduced. And God starts to answer this prayer, these prayers, um, why? There are two elements I want to emphasize. First of all, they are praying. So they introduce God into the picture. But secondly, they are praising. And the word praising means here that they were singing hymns. Imagine in that situation, your, stock, your feet in the stock, and that's very painful. Plus their backs uh, smitten and bleeding, very painful. Yet they are singing. How is that possible? That is God's grace. God gave them grace to do this. 
because they strengthened themselves in the Lord. And so, in the praising or in the hymn singing, you find also a response to God. So, prayer introduces God into their situation, and in the praising, in the hymn singing, they responded to God. And that is what God likes to see in our lives also, that whatever the situation is, we can bring a response to Him. I could give you a few examples of people who suffered greatly and who could yet praise God. Think of David when he was persecuted by his son Absalom. To, he wanted to kill him. When he was on the top of the hill, he praised God. He worshipped God, even in the day of trouble in which he was. There's an interesting verse in the Old Testament in the book of Job that says that God gives songs in the night. Now Job was going through very difficult times. And in that book we read that God gives songs in the night. And uh, in Psalm 42 is another reference to that, that God gives songs in the night. Where it is very dark. Here it was very dark, but God gave songs. And everything started to change. So my first point of a miracle is this. That in this situation, these believers were able to sing praises to God. I mean, that is a miracle in itself, that, that they could do that. That is a work of God. God was at work in their lives. I said, they were, here we see people are in God's school. There is evidence that God was at work. And the Lord wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18 the, be not be filled with wine. It doesn't mean that you cannot take a glass of wine. and the, the Bible is not speaking against that. But that you should not be controlled by it. Not be intoxicated by wine. Rather, be controlled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is the evidence. These two believers here are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that expresses himself not... In them boasting. Look, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, We are able to sing these songs even in the dark night. No. But the evidence is there. Here they are filled with the Holy Spirit. It is very clear. So this is a miracle that God has worked. Number one. The second miracle I suggest to you is that the prisoners were listening to them. Prisoners were a hardened people. They had experienced so many tough things. Who cares? That would be a prison. Oh, yeah, there's another one jumped there, uh, uh, thrown down there in that dungeon. Well, who cares? They were hardened through life. But here they noticed there is something very special that they had never experienced before. And so I think that through Paul's and Silas' example, a work of God started also in those prisoners who were listening. And that is another miracle. God can work in people who have hardened themselves. And that really takes a miracle. But that is the second miracle. And then a great miracle in verse 26. Suddenly. You remember that I said God's in control. That is here. The timing. God's in control. Then what happened? A great earthquake. Um, it is totally under God's control because the earthquake did not um, destroy the whole building it touched the foundations in such a way it shook the foundations but it um, worked in such a way that certain things were going to happen and I count them also as miracles by themselves that the doors were immediately opened so there was not a destruction of the building but the doors were opened that was another miracle and the bonds were all loosed. I count as a fish miracle. So, the third miracle is that at that time, at midnight, God came in and gave this earthquake. And it is a large or a great earthquake. Uh, Luke likes the word uh, great. A while ago I mentioned this verb for prayer is used 28 times. This word for great, mega, you know, mega burger, and say mega is used... 28 times in the book of Acts. 4 times, 7 times. That is very striking. And a great earthquake, and later on we see a loud voice, that's also the word mega. So this was a tremendous intervention of God, this great earthquake. And 
The fourth miracle, as I said, is that the doors were opened. Um, there was no destruction of the building, but the doors were opened. So God opened the doors. That's another topic that you can study all through the scriptures. When God opens things, it is really amazing what God can do. He can close a door, he can open a door. Re- Revelation 3, Philadelphia, he closes and no one can open. He opens and no one can close. This is the God who is at work here. All the doors were immediately opened. That's in connection with the day of grace. God can open doors that are closed. Later in this book we'll see Paul in prison in Rome. God opened doors there that no one could imagine to open. He could have either access to the house of the emperor, Nero. It's unbelievable. God can open doors nobody can open. And that is what we see in this book. And the fifth miracle was that the bonds of all those prisoners were loosed. Not all were with their feet in the stock in the dungeon like Paul and Silas were, but they were all um, in bonds as prisoners, chained. And those bonds were loosed. So I found it really a miracle. But that's not all. When you come to the next verses, then you'll see another miracle. So just verse 27. The jailer woke up. He had not heard much so far, but now he started to wake up. And he saw that the doors of the prison were opened. And then he wanted to kill himself. Now, just a little uh, background. In the Roman law, the jailkeeper was responsible with his own life for the prisoners who were in his jail. And so, instead of uh, waiting to be put on trial and then to be killed, he wanted to kill himself right away. Because he met, made a conclusion, and there he was wrong, thinking the prisoners had fled. So he should have examined first thoroughly whether his thinking was right. But often we see that people just think something, that is human thinking, but they are wrong. There are many people who believe that evolution, natural evolution is a fact. That everything comes from, that human beings come from the the apes, or everything comes from a, a, a maybe in the past. That is what people think, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it is right. It is wrong thinking. Here the thinking of this man was wrong. He didn't even check it out. He should have done some researching. But he didn't. He was wrong in his thinking. But there is God's intervention. Paul called out with a loud voice. Paul saw, like this man woke up, and so he could not see in the dark yet. He came from the outside, and so he couldn't see in the dark. But Paul was in the dark, and he could see this man in front of the door, uh, taking his sword, and he called out, do yourself no harm. Paul was very alert. And then we come to the sixth miracle. And that's the end of verse 28. Do thyself no harm for we are all here. Do you remember? All the prisoners were there because if one would flee, especially uh, Paul or, Bar- or Silas, then the jailer would have been put uh, to death himself. He would be executed himself. But Paul says, we are all here. Now, I find that a great miracle. What happened? The doors were opened, the bonds were loosed, and those prisoners stayed. (laughs) I find that a great miracle. You you would expect those prisoners would run off right away. They stayed. I find that a great miracle. Why did they stay? They were somehow somehow spellbound. They were somehow so much impressed by what happened. They didn't even think of fleeing. Then verse 29... The jailer asked for light, and then he rushed in, and trembling fell down before Paul and Silas. Now he fell down. Uh, In Luke's Gospel we find that Peter fell down at one time before the Lord's knees, and that was the right attitude. Uh, We have many other occasions that people fell down before the Lord. But now is this man falling down before Paul and Silas. In other situations, like Cornelius, Cornelius fell down before Peter when Peter came to visit and Peter said, no, don't do that, I'm just a man like you. And of course that is the right idea, but in this situation Paul and Silas didn't want to correct that, they thought that will come later, they'll just help this man. And this this man let them out. That's an interesting term. Um, 
they were they're still in that dungeon and so now he let them out so he, he had to lift them up and then lead them out of that dungeon and then out of the prison and saying that while this was going on he asked this question sirs what must I do that I may be saved so that can have two meanings the first meaning is this he was in trouble he thought well I, I will be um, put on trial by the Roman authorities and what's going to happen with me but of course the deeper meaning of this question is what must I do that I may be saved is a question that everyone has to face but notice also the attitude here uh, he, he submits to what Paul and, Bar- and Silas are going to say what must I do and that's another thing we saw that God is in control this is um, God at work and what this question implies, this question implies that this man is ready to submit to God. Not only to Saul, and, 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 or Paul and uh, Silas, but he is ready. With this question, what must I do? He's not saying, what do the authorities say that I should do? What do the people, what do the mob say that I should do? No, he says, what must I do? So that implies a recognition that there is a higher authority, that is God, to whom he must obey. And so that's the beginning of repentance. This man realizes there is someone higher who is in charge and who has a program. What must I do? And I find it very intriguing, but this form of the word must in Greek occurs 77 times in the New Testament and this must represents a program that God has we saw earlier that God is in charge and God is also in charge and connects with this program of salvation what must I do God has a plan and so this man is ready to submit to that plan he doesn't know that plan yet he doesn't know anything but he is ready to submit to that plan beforehand and so he is ready and what happened and I find that is the seventh miracle believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved that God brings this message even today is in itself a miracle this man didn't deserve it the society and we when we got saved we didn't deserve it it's God's sovereign grace and so the answer to this question is Believe, that means put your trust in the Lord. Now, when I say that, of course, we as believers, we need to put our trust in the Lord all the time. But in this connection, this man was not a believer yet. He had to become a believer. And so in order to become a believer, he has to start putting his trust in the Lord. So he starts a new life instead of putting his trust in the gods or instead of putting his trust in himself or in the authorities he now puts his trust in someone else in the Lord Jesus Christ Uh, somewhere else in this book we see that Paul's ministry is about repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so this repentance I think is implied in the fact that this man said what must I do that I may be saved but then the second point belief on the Lord Jesus Christ that is very much uh, emphasized here and that is a wonderful promise uh, I want to connect it with Romans 10.9 here we have uh, this what must I do to be saved believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved Romans 10 Uh, summarizes this in a very wonderful way Romans 10 verse 8 um, or verse 9 actually if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from among the dead you shall be saved now that second part is not explained here by Paul yet but here we have the, the, doc, the doctrine. It starts with um, believing with your heart. And then you will confess with your mouth. The two go together. Um, but in order to believe with your heart, first you have to hear something. And that is Paul's uh, explanation in Romans 10. You hear with your ear. So that's the message 
and then you believe it with your heart, and then you make this confession with your mouth, and you shall be saved. And that confession this man has made also, because later in the chapter we see that uh, he got baptized. So, this is an important point for us also. Uh, we need to hear the word of God, we need to believe it, but the belie- believing Uh, The word of God is also put your trust in a person. You put your trust in the Lord Jesus. So believing the word of God is also connected with putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The two go together. So and this implies then the uh, conversion of this man. Um, From God's side he is going to work so that this man believes. From his side he's going to uh, respond to this message, as we see in this passage. There are always two sides, what God does and what man does. God brings the message, man hears it and receives it. That is man's side. And the two always go together. You can't separate them. Interesting that he says, you and your house. And that can be misunderstood. It's not the point that now everyone in this house is automatically saved. The point is that God wants households. He wants families. You find that very clearly with Abram. Abram um, was the, is the father of all believers. And we see that the Lord said that he knew Abram, that Abram would command his whole house. So, God wants the house. But that doesn't mean that every member of that house Old, automatically becomes a believer. He also needs to hear the gospel and put his trust in the Lord, as we see in the rest of this story. So the seventh miracle was the message of grace and that he believed it. Of course, that implies a work of God who uses the message, who works then in the heart, but at the same time there is a response from man's side. You put your trust in him. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord. I like that expression, the word of the Lord. Because who is in charge here in this portion? We saw, first it looked like the world is in charge. The mob was in charge. The magistrates who failed were in charge. But we see now here that God is in charge. And that we see in all those miracles, that God is in charge. And that is why Paul speaks now to them the word of the Lord. The Lord is the one who is in charge. The Lord is the one who was rejected by the Jews. He is rejected in this world. He was put to death by uh, the world, by the Romans and by the Jews together. But now he is Lord over all. The Lord, uh, the risen Lord, has all authority. And he commands, as we saw earlier, he has an enterprise that started in Acts 2, and he is in charge. And so that is the word of the Lord. And that expression is found seven times in the book of Luke, uh, in the book of Acts. It's very interesting. This form, the word of the Lord, is found seven times. And that goes together with the idea of the kingdom. The Lord is the rejected king, but he has a kingdom. Today, the believers who recognize his lordship, his authority, are in that kingdom. We are now in the kingdom. Not in the kingdom as it will be seen in the millennium, in display, in, um, in outward uh, appearance. But now, this kingdom uh, displays itself in a moral way. The kingdom of God is seen in the believers and through the believers. When the Lord was on this earth, the kingdom was seen in him. He is the king and there was the kingdom. And now the kingdom of God is seen in the believers, in you and me today, who submit to the Lordship of Christ. And so the word of the Lord is important to submit to, and is the word of the Lord that was spoken to them, and the result was that all heard, and what we see then, that they all believed, this whole family was baptized. Now, that doesn't mean that there were babies present. This was an older man already, uh, retired, maybe 50 or 55. Um, So if he had children, if he was married, and if they had children, they were older ones. But this probably refers also to the (coughs) servants. In those days, uh, a family like that or a household like that would have servants. And so those servants would hear the word, and they also believed. They have heard what was going on, and they also believed. Um, 
that is implied in verse 32 they spoke to him the word of the Lord with all that were in his house so the emphasis here on what is preached and what they heard but at the same time there was a work of God and they believed that word that is not here specified in this particular verse but from the context we can understand that that God was at work and they, they believed so that is another miracle not only the jailer believed now all the people in the house believed so that is my eighth miracle then the ninth miracle is in verse 33 he took them the same hour of the night so on the spot and he washed them so here we see a ninth miracle this is a transformed life this is the evidence that this man was saved this is the it is really the, the confirmation that there was a change of heart and that is seen now in the way he deals with these prisoners he washes them from their stripes and so this is really a, the ninth miracle transformed life and on the basis of that Paul could baptize them he had the evidence they, were, they had responded to that word believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved they had preached the word of the Lord to all the people in the house and here was the evidence they were changed and so now they were baptized right away sometimes uh, we cannot do that on the spot um, but in some cases it can uh, be done but the evidence must be there that there is a changed life so some people have been living uh, under the control of certain habits that are not right it has to be shown it has to be evident that they are set free from that influence from idolatry or whatever it is and so they were baptized and the baptism is connected again with the lordship of Christ we talked about the kingdom the kingdom is seen in believers who submit to the authority of the Lord whole families who submit to the authority of the Lord that's the kingdom and now in baptism this is demonstrated we are baptized to the name of the Lord we identify with him the risen and uh, but rejected Lord and so they were straightway baptized it's very interesting so this transformed lives that is the ninth miracle and then the tenth miracle um, and then we are almost done is this joy now you know the epistle to the Philippians if you study the epistle to the Philippians Paul is in prison, that's another prison that's in Rome many years later and this epistle he writes to the Philippians is full of joy uh, at the end he says uh, rejoice in the Lord always and he repeats rejoice in the Lord and so, if you count very carefully, you find 16 times reference, references to joy or to rejoice. Here we have the beginning. In this city, in Philippi, in, in um, Lydia's home, and now here in the home of the jailer, there is the beginning of the assembly there in Philippi. And it is marked by joy. It's interesting. It started all the way here. And that is the tenth miracle that God gives joy in this family. Such a tremendous change. I count it as another miracle. I may be wrong, but I just like the number ten in this context. And um, perhaps the, the tenth miracle is also uh, tied to the fact that it says, having believed in God. So God's at work. This man put his trust in the Lord. He puts his trust in God. God's at work and he puts his trust in God. Having believed in God. That's another key word. That he had believed in God and was going to continue with God. Now the rest of the chapter is uh, very simple to understand. Um, there was then the next day a report from those rulers. The rulers had second thoughts and they wanted to have these prisoners go. Maybe they had heard something already about this earthquake, I don't know. And so then the policemen came. The lictors is really the, uh, the officers that were... Um, serving those rulers those ten rulers at those 
police officers at their disposal, or their, uh, the right hand man, and they would go around. They had also <coughs> these rods with which they could beat people, and so they would then also give this message to the jailer to have them go. The praetors have sent that ye may be let go. Verse 36. Now therefore, the jailer says to Paul, go out and depart in peace. We don't know what happened to the other prisoners, whether they were uh, released or still stayed there. The Bible doesn't tell us about it, so we cannot say uh, much about it. But maybe they also got saved. We don't know. Um, The power of God's grace is so wonderful, maybe they also got saved um, as being part of that house. Uh, another thing I just want to mention here in verse 36 now therefore go out and depart in peace this word peace is found seven times in the book of Acts and um, another thing if you think about it Lydia we saw the last time uh, a woman of good standing who had uh, servants who had a business uh, probably was pretty rich there is where the assembly started and now we see this jailer and his family who on earth could bring those two people together from a human perspective it would be impossible now here we see God's, in God's grace he brings them together and I want to apply that to us as we are here who would imagine to bring us together like we are uh, I've been in assemblies where you have 14 different nationalities represented or 14 different cultures. Um, it's amazing how God can bring all those people together. Here we see people from totally different backgrounds and now they are brought together in one and the same assembly. And as I mentioned earlier, that Luke stayed in that area and so God may have used Luke to work in that assembly and to help them grow and from Second Corinthians we know that there are later there are even a number of assemblies in this area. So Luke has worked also as an evangelist in, the, in those days. And there have been other assemblies formed in those years that Paul was away. Because it took about five years. Uh, I'm not, I have to check it, but let's say about five years before Paul would come back there. Maybe even longer than five years after the end of his third journey. So what we see here now we can ask the question, why did Paul uh, not just go away in secret? Why did Paul say this in verse 37? They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, us who are Romans. Why is Paul so adamant about this? I think there are two reasons. The first reason is that the authorities would understand that they had really acted wrongly. Paul was a Roman, Silas was a Roman citizen, of course they were also Jewish, but they were Romans. And for authorities, and especially in a Roman colony, to um, treat, uh, to abuse Roman citizen this way, they could have, that could have severe consequences for them. They could lose their job, they could even be persecuted by the authorities and maybe even killed because of that action. So that was very serious so that was seen as a great misstep and so they had to know that so they had done two mistakes they had beaten them before they even had a trial so before they had uh, assessed the situation so that was very unfair the second mistake was that they would beat have these Roman citizens beaten that was absolutely forbidden by Roman law And so Paul wants to set the record straight, but that's not the whole story. He wants them to know, these these authorities, that the people like Paul and and Silas and those who were with him, they were no criminals. They were uh, not people who were uh, trying to cause trouble in the city, as they had been accused in verse 20. Not at all. So Paul wanted those authorities to really see that also. But there's another reason. He wanted um, to be let out publicly by those uh, magistrates so that the whole population knew that these people were 
okay, they were no criminals. So not only that the leaders would know that, the rulers would know that, but the whole population would know that. Why was that so important? Because of the new assembly. The new assembly, they knew these were people who had been with Paul and Silas. And so if Paul and Silas would have left there in secret, the population would always think, the, those people are Lydia there? The, the, there's jailer there? That's bad company, you know. They were in, in connection with those troublemakers. And so Paul wanted to make sure that the population would not have that idea at all. They would know that these people are correct. And also the people who were with them are correct people. And so that was also important for the furtherance of the gospel and for the, the development of the assembly there when Luke stayed there, that he would not have this, um, this form of... Um, yeah, what should I say? Misunderstanding or even uh, misjudgment against them. They would be seen as honest people, honorable people, and there was nothing against them. And that is why Paul wanted to leave the city in this way. And so then they came and they brought them out. It's interesting how they let them out in an honorable way. And then they asked them to go out of the city. But before they left there, and we know... Later in chapter 17 he went on to Thessalonica, that's also part of uh, Macedonia, but further south. Uh, before they would go on their way, they went to Lydia, and they had organized uh, the things, and have seen the brethren, and they exhorted them. The word, this is the last verse now, where we are in verse 40, it uh, means they encouraged them, because they were just, they just started to believe. I mean, you start to believe today and tomorrow even on, on your own and thrown before the wolves as it were. You need a lot of help. And so these people received encouragement from Paul and Silas before they left and with Timothy, before the three of them would leave, they encouraged them. They exhorted them. It can be also translated besieged, but the root meaning is this. They stood right beside them and talked to them to encourage them, to strengthen them. And then they left them. But they left them, of course, with the care of the Lord. And as I said earlier, also with the care of Luke, who would stay there and would help them. And so that is how they went away. So here is where our chapter uh, stops. And so if there are questions, we can talk about them now. And then we can close in a word of prayer and in a hymn, perhaps. I'm not saying that I covered everything, but this is uh, uh, some of the main points that I wanted to share. If there's something that I forgot, or something that is, needs to be uh, explained or corrected, uh, you can say it. Isn't it amazing how the Gentiles ended up being called Abraham's seed? In mm -hmm. Galatians 3, yep. we see it there. How mm -hmm. in verse um, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that's pretty amazing, isn't it? It is. Especially when you consider that originally God chose Abraham from among the nations mm -hmm. to set him apart. That's it. But now the nations are being drawn into the family of God. And on top of that, I would say there is this parallel. Abraham, as you say, he was... Um, um, God took him from among the Gentiles because they were idol worshippers. Mm -hmm. You can see that in Joshua 24. So Abram was an idol worshipper before he got saved, before God led them to the promised land. But the point now is this. Abram has children, and those children are not the physical descendants uh, he had in Israel. The believers among them, like Paul became uh, Abram's seed the moment he believed,
uh, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, they became Abraham's seed when they believed. But now, the miracle that Frank emphasizes is that we as people from the Gentiles become Abraham's seed. It is a real miracle. But it applies to all the same. In that sense, uh, Galatians and other portions show there is no difference. Because God reaches now out to all. Just like He reached out to Abram when he was still an idol, idol worshipper. So God reaches out now to all, whether they are Jewish, whether they are Gentile. And all can become uh, Abram's seed. They can all become Abram's children if they believe. It's, a, it's really a, a wonder of God's grace. But the difference was originally when Abraham was chosen, he was chosen as God's inheritance. And now we've all become a part of that inheritance. Yeah. yeah, so the limitations that were there in the Old Testament, those limitations are not there. Removed. Yeah. We do have the contrast of the woman that was being used by Satan uh-huh. and the work of God, the Holy Spirit, in the opposite direction. Yeah. It's a me- tremendous contrast. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to highlight that and then I forgot. So it's really important to see that, the tremendous contrast that we see in this chapter. Yeah. On the one hand, a poor girl, Satan's uh, instrument, and then what God does to make people his instrument. And this girl, I said earlier, we don't know the composition of this assembly, but some believe that this girl also became a believer and would then also be part of the assembly there. So that's an, uh, another example of what I said earlier, with different backgrounds all put together. Another interesting thing was verse 21 and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive. It's very amazing as you look around you and you see we are governed by the laws of the land. In this land we're very fortunate we have freedom, etc. But just look in the United States. Just recently, this year or last year, they removed the Christian day of prayer. But they introduced the Islamic day of prayer. And so you see the two cultures that are mentioned there, that's what we're striving against here as well. And the freedoms which we take for granted, they're being removed. Yeah, that's pretty solemn. But we are not... uh, What we see in this chapter, Paul and Silas were not involved in that kind of activity. And that's important for us. We, we are not in agreement with those things that happen, but we are not called to, um, to change this society. We are called to be a witness to this society. Lots of lessons, right? And also lots of encouragement. I find that a chapter like this is great encouragement. Mm